Title, Whispers from the Unknown. Author, Paul Shelby. Narrator, Joe Callum. Chapter 8. Over here, hey, please, just a second. Dozens of voices were calling me. The bright rays of light had diminished. I heard a real commotion. I lowered my arm and slowly opened my eyes. A swarm of photographers was bombarding me. Flashes were going off. Cameras were rolling. To my great surprise, a crowd surrounded me. I was the prey of a horde of frenzied people. Please, when did you realize that their decision to blow everything up was made and that they were going to do it no matter what? Several microphones were now facing me. What were they talking about? What did they want from me? After a few minutes of chaos, I was able to identify the location. We were near the airport exit. A woman grabbed me by the waist, pulling me back. Come with me, Mr. Hesse. I followed her. Police officers escorted us to a police vehicle. Inside, two men in suits were waiting for us. One in the back signaled to me with his head, and the other sitting in the driver's seat remained still. I sat down next to the first man, and the woman sat on my right, closing the door. The car started, its siren blaring. Two other vehicles flanked us. The convoy was going at a brisk pace. The woman asked me, Are you holding up? Don't worry. Just a few questions, and then you'll be allowed to rest. After several minutes of silence, I couldn't contain my curiosity. Where are we going, and why all this fuss? What are you talking about? She replied, astonished. What am I doing here, for God's sake? She remained speechless. After a short moment and a glance exchanged with her colleague, she continued, After such an event, I understand that all this might seem unbearable to you and that you would like to remain calm. But I'll repeat it. In an hour or two, you'll be able to rest and unwind. Okay, okay, wait. I'd like to understand what's going on. Who are you and why am I here talking to you and where are we going? I'm sorry, Mr. Hesse, but I don't follow you. Damn, she's stupid, I thought. Okay, I'll calm down and start again. I sighed and continued. I don't know who you are, I don't know what I'm doing here, and I must admit that this situation is as distressing as it is annoying. What I wanted was to take a plane to Bangkok. Instead, I lived through a crazy nightmare, and now I'm here. You say you're going to ask me questions. I don't know where you're taking me or what you want to talk about. Finally, judging by the general astonishment I saw on their faces, I felt that my total incomprehension of the situation was now clear. They exchanged a few words, then the woman took out a cell phone. My nosy little neighbor called someone named Dr. Asvut and arranged to meet him. She said to me with great compassion, We're almost there. Relax. We're police officers. You must be experiencing the aftermath of an emotional shock. Everything will be fine. The situation didn't leave me with many alternatives. Stop the car, I asked calmly. Mr. Hesse, we're almost there. Everything will be fine. Stop the car. We're in the middle of nowhere. In five minutes, you'll meet Dr. Asvut. Everything will be fine. I didn't let her finish and abruptly opened the door. An idea was obsessing me. I had to leave these people to get away. I was sprawled over this woman and tried to jump out of the vehicle. She screamed and held me back. Her colleague did the same. The car had now slowed down and was zigzagging. I turned my head and saw, before it hit me, a clenched fist and then nothing. Chapter 9 My head felt like a ton a distant glimmer drawing me in. Perhaps I was dead? Or perhaps I was still in one of those delirious dreams? My closed eyelids began to tremble. I was regaining consciousness, slowly, very slowly. The implausibility of all my recent memories made me want to prolong the moment. I opened my eyes. I was lying down. A mattress conformed to every contour of my head, back, buttocks, and legs. I was reconnecting with my body, gradually, part by part. 
My arms and torso were restrained. Someone hadn't appreciated my new career as a stuntman. With pain, I lifted my head to observe the surroundings. The white room was covered with mattresses on all its walls. Did they think I would ram into them like a ram? Son of a bitches, I thought. They had tied me up like Gulliver. No furniture, no objects, and especially no difficulty in understanding that I was probably in a madhouse. The kind of place where I could think I was a frog for five or six years without it being exceptional. A house for lunatics, a zoo for crazies. Given my recent experiences, I was probably in the right place. All these nightmares, the airport, the flying queers, the half-broken blonde angel, damn it, I had literally blown a fuse. During a party, a drug must have knocked me out. No, scratch that. Knock me down. I'll have to think about giving this chemist a decoration. Well, the essential thing was to regain some semblance of reason and to get out of this flying fish aquarium as soon as possible. The place was hot, everything in its place. It was time to hand over the baton to a real sprinter. In order to maximize my chances, I had to play the card of reason and serenity. Not wanting to cause a scene again, I preferred to continue napping rather than start wriggling like one of the locals. They must have administered sedatives because, despite the gravity of the situation, I felt strangely good. I didn't care about anything. Not about this place, not about what would happen next, not about the psychiatrists I would probably meet. The important thing had just been declared. Despite the medication, I had a huge erection. Where there are doctors, there are always nurses, maybe some pretty ones under their gowns. Yes, come talk to me. Take care of me. I'm sick. This vision allowed me to fall asleep with a smile. A smile and an erection. The door opened. An older man entered. He looked like an old scientist. His face was jovial and his demeanor benign. He approached and asked me, So did you have a good night, Mr. Hesse? Very good, thank you. My name is Dominique Asvout. I am a psychiatrist and you are in my clinic. I'm sorry we had to tie you up, but the police told me you were a bit agitated. Oh, nothing much, you know. The police often exaggerate. He smiled and continued. You got quite a bump on your forehead. Is it okay? Does it hurt? No, since you probably drugged me like an elephant, I have to admit I don't feel much anymore. Could you untie me? Well, you see, we were planning to torture you a little before... No, I'm kidding, of course. I'll send you a nurse. Oh, yes. A beautiful single woman naked under her gown, please. I'm joking, too. We'll see each other later, Mr. Hesse. We exchanged a smile. He turned around and left the room. He left the door ajar. We were not alone. I could hear many voices and noises outside. This mind wizard was quite likable. If I had to have my brain dissected, it might as well be by someone who inspires me. I didn't know if it was the effect of the medication or something else, but I felt really good, really strong. To shorten my stay, I decided not to reveal anything about my delirious dreams. I would only describe a large, dark passage, a loss of memory. That's all. However, I was quite impatient to hear what had actually happened. Two nurses burst into my room, well, into this room. They entered chatting. After all, I don't care. She stopped and said, Hello, I'm Carolina, I'll take you to your room said this pretty brunette. I added, It's a shame, I felt good here. Plus, I had always dreamed of being tied to my bed like an animal. You're a joker, Mr. Hesse. You know, it was for your safety. While talking, she loosened the straps. The other one came back with a wheelchair, and I added, Ah, my carriage. I hope you're fit. I'm used to driving fast. The two nurses burst out laughing at my lame joke. It was a good sign. They seemed to appreciate my humor. They didn't exactly look like those nurses from erotic TV movies, but I was hungry. Sandra and Carolina led me to a real room, with windows, closets, and blank walls. Well, I mean, without mattresses. 
The bed seems small for all three of us to sleep in, don't you think? I surprised myself. I was being audacious, and I did it with a humorous tone effortlessly. The two young women didn't seem bothered by my behavior. They just laughed. I should get into fights more often and take more punches in the face. It suits me, I thought. After five minutes, they gave me the final instructions and left the premises. I refrained from touching their buttocks as a thank you. No, if you want to go far, take care of your horse. It was probably a mix of medication and deep sleep that had put me in such great shape. Well, as for the journey, I was a bit late, but the important thing was there. Physically, everything was fine, and mentally, I was on fire. The rest of the day went smoothly. Around seven in the evening, another doctor came with my two favorite nurses, and we went for a complete checkup. They brought me back to my room late in the evening. On the way back, we met a guy who looked strange, probably a lunatic. He seemed terrified. He couldn't stop staring at me. I smiled at him from my rolling bed, but it didn't change anything. One of the nurses said, Are you lost, Josh? What's wrong with you? Come on. She left with the ladder, probably to take him back to his quarters. I saw him turn his head, continuing to watch me as he walked away. Arriving in my room, I fell back asleep without a shadow of a problem. I didn't have any dreams. The next morning, I had an appointment with the magnificent Asvut. I wished to clarify some gray areas. This meeting delighted me. Once I was seated in front of his large desk, he came and sat facing me on a good leather armchair. The place was very bright and spacious. There was an atmosphere that pleased me. The professor had a good face. He asked me calmly, How do you feel, Gabriel? Very well, thank you, and you? Good. The two nurses who are taking care of you told me that you didn't ask them any questions. It's better while you rest and regain your composure. I looked at him without saying anything. Each of his words, each of his intonations reached me clearly. We were on the same wavelength. I squinted and waited. Before the episode in the police vehicle, what do you remember, Gabriel? I had just boarded the plane and I was waiting. Okay, could you detail a little more, please? Well, nothing special. I had just boarded. My seat was next to a man who worked in fashion. He seemed polite, that's all. Polite, but what else? Do you remember what you talked about? Suddenly, my gaze shifted to a part of his desk where there were drawers. I concentrated slightly and understood. Doctor, why are you recording the conversation? Asvut seemed extremely surprised. How do you know? What to answer him? Even I couldn't explain it. Your dictaphone makes a slight noise. I'm sorry, but I've always had extremely developed hearing, like a real wolf. He seemed troubled. He used the silence that followed to try to hear something. Gabriel, you really surprise me, but let's move on. I'll explain. This recording is intended for the police. Two choices were available to me. Either this interview took place in the presence of two agents from the Ministry of the Interior's Intelligence Service, or I had to record it so that they could do their job. I thought you would prefer this option. Anyway, I would have told you at some point. Okay, Doctor, but you need to stop tiptoeing around with me. I'm fine, I feel good. I have no problem except for this amnesia. I had changed my tone. I was tired of playing the victim. Okay, understood, Gabriel. He paused for a moment and continued. What you call a little amnesia lasted for three days. Three days during which you and the other passengers and crew members were taken hostage. Your plane was hijacked. Five people died, including two members of the cabin crew and three of the hijackers. Only the leader of this commando survived in part thanks to you. You neutralized him and prevented him from blowing up the plane. I remained motionless, unable to think of anything, unable to react, 
I was absent. The story had suddenly transported me for a short minute. I couldn't see anymore. I couldn't hear anymore. I wasn't anymore. The doctor's voice gradually brought me back to reality. Gabriel, Gabriel, are you okay? Do you want to rest? We can continue later. No, no, I'm listening to you. I'm... Yes, you are. A bit stunned, but it's okay, continue. This Jean-Alexandre de l'Espinois belongs to a radical sect born in Europe. These people carry out actions to draw attention to the barbaric treatment of homosexuals in many countries. Well, that's their official propaganda speech, but behind that there is especially a bunch of twisted people who develop theories about the place of gays on earth, in society, about a so-called superiority. There is a taste that recalls some dark periods of humanity. This hijacking is unprecedented. This sect had never gone so far. This commando of four people, after conveying their message, expressed their determination to go all the way. A bomb was supposed to pulverize the plane. Them with it. These are information from the authorities who detained de l'Espinois. But how come you have so much information? Obviously, by asking the question, I already guessed the answer. Well, okay, let's play it straight. I'm a psychiatrist, but I also work for the intelligence services. Well, I practice my profession in different directions. He paused and continued. We had spotted the activity of this organization, but they caused us a lot of tracking and infiltration problems. Even at the level of identities, it was very strange. De l'Espinois was spotted a few months ago, but there is no information about his birth, his origin, its total void. So the basis of our interview is now clearer. The interview lasted about half an hour. He told me about the main events of those three days. How the hijackers coldly slit the throat of a steward and a stewardess to assert their determination as soon as they took control of the plane. The rapid disclosure to passengers and authorities of information about a bomb that could pulverize the plane. Their demands to appear on as many TV, news programs as possible. The mandatory publication of texts in various major newspapers. These crazies demanded to be able to verify everything under penalty of executing new people. They had managed to smuggle war rifles and knives on board. This was part of the mysterious aspects that still had no explanation. Among all this, what troubled me the most was, during the three days of captivity, my health deteriorated very rapidly, so much so that I fell into a coma on the last day. Given the circumstances, this had not been the main cause for concern. Azvut told me more precisely about the last 15 minutes. The three terrorists, after muttering some sort of prayer simultaneously in their strange language, turned their weapons on themselves and committed suicide. Only the leader of the commando remained alive. He was shouting incomprehensible things while brandishing a rifle in one hand and a device in the other. Everyone quickly realized that it was the bomb detonator. Their testimonies converge. De L'Espinois had gone insane. He looked like an enlightened guru and the situation was desperate. The one who turned everything around was you, Gabriel. Although very surprised, I asked him, Go on, tell me. By some miracle, you reappeared and confronted him. According to all the testimonies, you addressed him in this unknown language, or at least it seemed like you understood each other. What he just said intrigued me to the highest degree. I was ready to hear a lot of things, but I only speak my mother tongue and a more than approximate English. That's impossible, Doctor. We consulted your file, and indeed, we are dubious. We have a set of information. Information about each person, and according to our sources, we have nothing about any language learning you could have done in recent years. Can you confirm this to me? Of course, I assure you it's impossible. I think you are sincere, Gabriel. 
but the facts reported by the people present are reliable 99%. We have already seen similar behaviours in extreme cases of torture, pseudo-enchantment that could resemble more serious psychotic disorders, or people who have approached death. In your case, I don't have an opinion yet. Ideas, but no opinion. Anyway, let's continue. He looked at the time and continued, consulting what must have been a report. So you confronted him. You would have conversed with him for a brief moment. Your attitude towards him would have been very authoritarian, even threatening. I don't understand much of this. You walked through the plane while continuing to talk to him and stopped in front of him. The passengers had the collective reflex to go in the other direction and start escaping by forcing the exit doors. There was a real riot that caused several injuries. Some people didn't wait for the security devices to be installed and jumped. Others, more curious or for lack of choice, observed the scene from a distance. The most incomprehensible part is yet to come. Witnesses report that Delespinois handed you his weapon and raised the detonator as if he were about to commit the irreparable. That's when you pointed the barrel of his rifle at his forehead. I don't quite understand the meaning since if he had used his bomb, he would have died with everyone. Why give you the weapon while keeping the detonator if ultimately he was afraid of dying? Perhaps you can enlighten us. Anyway, according to witnesses, you both started repeating the same words in this unidentified language. According to some witnesses, you both seemed to be crying. It lasted for two or three minutes. You can imagine the panic on board. Damn, I have no memory of any of this. I exclaimed. It can be deduced that it is still thanks to you that Del Espinois was unable to carry out his macabre plan. But let's finish. So at that precise moment, the intervention forces intervened. Once inside, they neutralized both of you. The hostages and the cops must have thought I was one of the crazies, right? It's very strange. I don't hide from you that they use different devices to find out what was happening inside the plane. Moreover, it is for this reason that they entered at that precise moment. Regarding you until you woke up, it was impossible to have suspicions. But Doctor, I could ultimately be one of the terrorists and have changed my mind at the last moment. Yes, exactly, but then what would you have served for? You just slept the whole time only to finally point de l'Espinois with his own weapon and become a hero. It doesn't make sense. Anyway, I'm not here to conduct an interrogation or an investigation. I'm a doctor, and what matters to me is your physical and mental state. My instructions today are clear. To relate the facts as they have been reported to me, and to observe your reactions with you Anyway, what would be the point of hiding what all the passengers saw and reported? I'm counting on you, Gabriel, for your full cooperation. Could I turn out to be dangerous? But why would you want to be a danger? A danger to whom and why? Wait, Gabriel, don't worry. We take care of you. You're not in elementary school. You're in a specialized center. I have a few dangerous people. Yes. I don't know why I'm saying this. It's ridiculous. It makes no sense. I was troubled by this whole crazy story. Asvald concluded. Well, I think we can stop here for today. In a very synchronized manner, at the end of his sentence, the door opened. The two nurses entered. I think he wanted to illustrate his point. His message had been conveyed, but strangely I expected them to enter at that precise moment. I was in a strange state, torn between shadowy areas that made me uncomfortable and a clarity of mind that I was discovering within myself. The rest of the day passed calmly. Sandra and Carolina were taking good care of me. 
They brought me a bunch of books and magazines that were uninteresting to say the least. I wasn't allowed to watch TV or use the phone. I felt a bit disconnected from the world. Anyway, connections with the outside world were not my priority. My inner life was already tumultuous enough. My absolute wish was to understand, to understand what was happening. I could hear the sound of lava deep inside the volcano, and impatience was brewing. Chapter 10 Lying on a sofa in a majestic room adorned with multiple sculptures, I watched them dance like two princesses. The movements of their arms were remarkably graceful. They resembled serpents swaying to a light and intoxicating melody. Sparkling colors adorned certain parts of their half-naked bodies, which I suspected to be both soft and rough. This belly dance made the silhouette of these two goddesses so desirable. Their playful, victim-like gazes sought to enchant me. They wished for me, desired me within them. Gradually the music intensified, and in perfect harmony the dance became magnetic, the movements more explicit. The back-and-forth motion of their hips, of their desirable buttocks, ignited violent urges within me, urges I wanted to unleash upon these two women. I closed my eyes. A veritable volcano began to erupt within the depths of my being, a force concentrated and taking shape at the center. I erupted with desire. Death was near. I was no longer human, but a beast. A beast thirsting for sex, for blood. I wanted to penetrate them until death. The place no longer mattered. The sky, the earth were no more. Only my dagger and their wounds existed. Opening my eyes, we had changed location. I recognized my hospital room. The distant light from the corridor was perfect for admiring the spectacle while maintaining the necessary darkness. Sandra was devoting herself entirely to her task. Her hair brushed against my stomach. I felt the caresses of her tongue on the tip of my penis. She engulfed me entirely. I vibrated to the rhythm of her mouth, her delicate hand holding my penis, an integral part of this pleasure. A figure emerged from the shadows and approached the bed. Caroline was completely naked. Her arching posture accentuated her breasts. I desired her. She placed one hand on my forehead, the other on my chest. Her mouth met mine. We exchanged a kiss blending extreme eroticism and devotion. My mind did not wish to understand the situation, but only to experience it. Her lips parted from mine. Regaining my senses, I realized we had changed location again. I now found myself standing in the center of this sumptuous place. These two wonderful girls lay before me, embracing each other, awaiting me. My excitement had reached its peak. Lowering my head, I discovered that my body was completely transformed. The shape of my arms, my torso, my posture, my skin tone was much darker and appeared much rougher. My giant physique impressed me. I felt a power emanating from me. I had become what I had once been. I admired my long fingers with their perfect nails when suddenly their voices penetrated my thoughts. Come. Come, we are yours, come. I watched them kiss each other, moaning with pleasure. At that moment, I had the strange sensation of being observed. Come, what are you waiting for? We are yours. I gently took Carolina's foot, effortlessly bringing her to me. Her legs spread before me, ready to receive me. My first thrust triggered a lightning bolt. Thousands of voices exulted. The walls and the floor vibrated to the rhythm of our now commenced union. My right hand caressed the other woman lying next to us. I became a power absorbing all the energy around me. As my pleasure increased, I lost myself, becoming the nucleus of the universe. Carolina's eyes rolled back. Her wide open mouth revealed a tongue whose exquisite flavor I knew. My movements became more sweeping, faster, stronger. Turning my gaze to Sandra, I grabbed her by the neck abruptly and pinned her to the ground as if I feared she would escape. She too belonged to me. Our coupling had become bestial. The crucial moment arrived, 
I no longer control the situation. I only remember screaming with pleasure, or rather roaring with pleasure. Slowly returning to myself, the delicious Carolina breathed rapidly, emerging from a true trance. Calm had returned. Sandra, eyes wide open, no longer moved. I slowly removed my hand from her neck. Her body remained inert. I had taken her life. Chapter 11 Standing up suddenly, I struggled to contain my emotions. Out of breath, I glanced at the clock, which read five in the morning. My heart was pounding, beads of sweat rolling down my forehead. The fear was still there, buried deep within me. These dreams that blurred with reality were the main source of it. The inability to understand, my shattered sense of direction, everything was just a whirlwind in my head. Was I going mad? And ultimately, could I still confidently affirm that a specific moment was a moment of reality? And this presence, this new energy that I felt intermittently, where did it come from? Did it belong to me? And why did I fear it so much while not truly wanting it to disappear? Too many questions faced with a void of answers. Another nightmare, more grotesque images. I probably needed to talk to Asvud about it. He might be able to help me. I decided not to call a nurse. Besides, what could I tell them? That I had a horrible nightmare and felt unwell. That in my dream delirium, I was having sex with them and killing them. Come on, Gabriel. It's just a dream. Go back to sleep. I closed my eyes, trying to think only of pleasant things, but even then... I found myself relishing images that my morals forbade. My sense of direction now rested on a marshy ground, its thick fog concealing only quicksand and chaotic vegetation. I struggled. I fought without real convictions. The state of my mind could be likened to an endless free fall. I managed, somehow, to forget myself and let some time pass. During this rest, I felt observed again. Chapter 12 Five, four, three, two, one. Carolina burst into the room. I knew someone would enter precisely at that moment. It was starting to amuse me. But soon enough, my curiosity reminded me of my purpose. This dream, so vivid, gave me the impression that I knew her better. Always so cheerful, after greeting me and checking that everything was in order, she headed for the door. I couldn't resist asking her. Carolina. Yes. Did you have a good night? She seemed a little surprised, probably because of the slightly trembling tone of my voice. Yes, very good. Why do you ask? Was yours restless, Gabriel? Her simple response reassured me. I gave her a broad smile and answered negatively. There I was reassured. I just had to forget about it bury that macabre memory in a corner of my mind and never bring it up again. Their night had been a normal one, perhaps even pleasant. Chapter 13 Asvout came to see me briefly during the day. I seized this opportunity to express my impatience. Apart from his two nurses, a doctor, one or two guards, and him I didn't see anyone else. The floor I was on was deserted. Most of the examinations took place in my room, and after my interview with him, I was immediately taken back. He admitted that this was part of the security measures. Investigations are ongoing, but soon you will be interrogated in my presence by the police, and at that point, things may change. But for now, we remain with this organization. If you need anything, just ask. Having no rights to anything useful or entertaining, my list of requests was quickly covered. By the way, is my family aware of where I am? Don't worry. They are informed of your good health. They understand the situation easily. Everything will be back to normal, Gabriel. Well, I couldn't be completely satisfied with these answers, but I settled for them because before leaving... 
as Voot confessed that there was a chance the police would come very late in the evening to continue the interview that had already begun. This made the situation somewhat tense. My mental state and the investigation seemed completely intertwined. So, would it be a therapeutic interview or an interrogation? Doctor, I would like to share some strange things with you, things I can't explain. Gabriel, whether or not the police come tonight, it can probably wait a few hours. Running a clinic for lunatics couldn't be an easy task, but his lack of availability was inconvenient. Telling the cops about my nighttime delusions was out of the question. A guard remained in the corridor near my door. I was confined to my room. Sitting cross-legged on my bed, I searched for any detail that could occupy me. Turning my head from left to right, I inspected the place. Even the smallest insect would have been welcome. But the place was smooth, bland. There was nothing interesting about it. What a crappy room. I returned to the stack of magazines that were supposed to entertain me. They really took me for a fool. These readings about nature, cars, and other topics bored me to death. I realized that, in a very surprising way, I was reading a tiny phrase diagonally on a page that was quite far from my field of vision. This realization interrupted this phenomenon. Very perplexed, I tried again, but the new attempt yielded nothing. Concentrating doubly, I resumed my work, but apart from making me squint, which made my vision even blurrier, the result was a failure. Absolute calm reigned. It was beautiful outside, but unable to open the window, I couldn't even enjoy it. Really, I was bored like never before, and God knows I was familiar with the subject. I opened the door to my room. The man on duty looked at me questioningly. I explained to him that I was extremely bored alone without any occupation, and if he didn't mind, we could get to know each other a bit. Antonio introduced himself. He was a big, very strong guy. His way of speaking didn't imply a brilliant mind, but someone simple yet pleasant. I had spent about three days in this place, and it was the first time I had heard his voice. He reminded me of a soldier. I had the opportunity to be around them for a few months. These people, for the most part a bit dim, constantly claimed to have a pragmatic mind, a straightforward mind. The will was generally there, but the often funny result left me perplexed. They matched a constant desire for pragmatism with a total inability to reflect. This unique cocktail I found it in Antonio's gaze. I would have loved to play chess with him. It would have allowed me to get to know the little genius hidden in the depths of his big, ox-like head. I shared my idea with him, and surprisingly he shared my enthusiasm. But, Antonio, do you know the rules? I played it a long time ago with friends. You'll have to remind me of some rules, but don't worry, I often won. Don't worry, my friend, I'll explain everything to you again, and since you seem to understand quickly, it'll be... interesting. He told me he would take care of everything and would join me with the necessary as soon as he was ready. Of course, if he received permission from Asvut. I pretended to be impressed by his organizational skills and returned to my room. Unfortunately, Antonio must not have received Asvout's consent because he never came back with the game, was replaced, and they didn't live happily ever after and didn't have many children. It was a shame. Time would have been less boring, and his presence would have surely amused me a lot. At the end of the day, as expected, Carolina came to fetch me to take me to the doctor's office. I took the opportunity to ask her, Sandra isn't working today. It's her day off today. Why do you prefer her presence to mine? No, not at all. I just worry about my two nurses whom I love so much. You know, we work a lot. And Sandra needs rest right now. She's a bit overworked, but don't worry, everything is fine. I'll tell her that you're worried about her. It'll probably make her happy. She smiled at me and gestured for me to follow her. We walked briskly. Chapter 14 What a surprise it was when I entered the office. The woman with the weasel-like face and her friend with the big fists stood facing the doctor. 
Everyone turned around and seemed to appreciate my arrival. Gabriel, let me introduce you again to Lieutenant Herme and Agent Trill. Hello, Gabriel. Jessica Herme. I'm glad to see you again. The short woman extended her hand to me as she approached. You scared us last time. We regret having to use force. But you didn't leave us much choice. While the woman was talking to me, I saw my aggressor circling around to greet me. He introduced himself. Agent Trill, I hope you don't hold it against me. No, in a way, you saved my life. I wouldn't go that far. The car wasn't going that fast. You were a bit excited. I just calmed you down, he said with false regrets in his voice and a smirk. I'll get you one day, I thought to myself. After this protocol of politeness, we settled around the desk. Hermai began. We are working closely with Dr. Azvut. First of all, I would like to share two fundamental pieces of information with you. She pulled a newspaper from her bag, unfolded it, and placed it prominently on the desk. Incredible. My photo was on the front page of this newspaper, with the headline, Coming out of a coma, he becomes a hero. Paying a little attention, I recognized the airport where I had regained consciousness. The lieutenant continued. And that's not all. You made all the front pages of all the major newspapers. The footage filmed at the airport has been broadcasted on televisions around the world, so you can imagine that people know you outside. Trill spoke up. Asvout, or rather, Dr. Asvout made us listen to the recordings of your interviews. What happened to you is bewildering. It's good that you have all the information to understand what was happening during your... lethargy. So the doctor told you about an explosive device. The bomb placed on the plane, of course. Thanks to you, it couldn't be used, right? I don't remember anything, but apparently that's what happened. You would have prevented Della Spinois. Well, it's not very clear, but the fact is that he didn't trigger his detonator. I didn't like the tone Trill was using to talk to me. Yes, yes, I'm a hero, and I saved everyone. Wait, those are quick conclusions. We'll see about our final conclusions. Asvout, seeing that our communication had quickly become difficult, spoke up. Let's not beat around the bush, Gabriel. What Agent Trill wants to tell you is that there was never a bomb on the plane. Wait, you told me the opposite yesterday. Yes, because we needed to give the experts time to do their job. There was indeed an explosive device, but it was unusable. Was it diffused during the hostage-taking? Lieutenant Herme continued. No, this device was never usable. Imagine a very large firecracker without a fuse. That's what was placed on the plane. That doesn't make sense. What does Delis Pinois say? I asked. Another problem. He doesn't say anything. Trill added. This lunatic refuses to say anything. We're going to step up. Trill seemed to be a person with limited patience. His way of speaking, his rapid-fire sentences exasperated me. He was the kind of guy who, having received a strict education with a lot of stupid principles from probably a very authoritarian father, has believed since childhood that he has a mission to be a vigilant on Earth. How touching! His presence annoyed me. If I had to make revelations, I would have refused to do so in his company but I had absolutely nothing to say. The conversation went on like this for hours. I felt like we were going in circles. They told me the entire hostage-taking story two or three times, and in fragmented parts, once by one, once by the other. I listened. I answered their questions when I could, which was rare. It was late, but they kept going. I felt like they were waiting for me to deliver the key to the mystery. The facts were perfectly inconsistent, de l'Espinois silent. The last solution was me. They were on the wrong track, I had to tell them, make them understand. You know, I think I have recorded this story in every detail. I'm as amazed as you are, but I have no explanation to offer you. Really, I'm doing my best to remember anything. The last thing I remember is falling asleep after meeting Jean-Alexandre, that's all. You call him by his first name? 
That's interesting, Trill remarked. This guy had the gift of infuriating me to the highest degree. His incessant remarks, his comments like a neurotic, and that face, that asshole face. I still took the trouble to answer him. Jean-Alexandre de l'Espinois. Is that okay, or do I need to be even more formal? Mr. Jean-Alexandre de l'Espinois, the one responsible for a plane hijacking case who slit two people's throats and saw his three pals getting their heads blown off after exclaiming incantations in a mysterious language. Perhaps the word responsible is suspect coming from me. Don't get mad, Hesse. I'm just listening to you, and if it bothers you to be questioned, I don't give a damn. This cop disgusted me. He was taking advantage of the situation when he was just a microbe. He didn't know who he was dealing with. Get down on your knees before me, insect. Especially since I realized that I was staring at him and seeing the sudden fear on his face. The intensity of my hatred must have been easily perceptible. After a brief moment of discomfort, Asvout broke the silence. Jessica, I think it would be good to stop here for tonight. I agree, Doctor. We're all tired. The night will bring us advice. Let's meet again tomorrow. A regenerating energy suddenly brought me back to life. This hatred towards Trill seemed to have nourished me. I was tired of wasting my time with these people. Another day in my room doing nothing would be unbearable for me. I left Trill and turned to Asvut. Doctor, I have been understanding and I'm doing everything I can to help you, right? I never said otherwise, Gabriel. I won't hide from you that I'm starting to get fed up. I spend my days waiting. I'm alone and have no company. When this afternoon one of your employees asked if he could play chess with me, you refused. I'm sorry, but he's not authorized for that. Not everyone does everything here. Wait, if you don't find an explanation in the coming weeks, I won't continue to live like a hermit during that time. I'm not the only decision maker. You're in my clinic, but under a very special regime. Your memory loss justifies your presence, but you're an integral part of a terrorism case, so understand the situation. Lieutenant Hermoy continued. And you know, Gabriel, compared to De Lespinois' incarceration conditions, you're sleeping in a three-star hotel and a complete team is taking care of you. His daily life is quite different. This comparison with that lunatic provoked a rage in me that I couldn't contain. I stood up suddenly from my seat, leaned on the desk, and without turning my head, pointed at Trill who remained silent and addressed Asvut. How dare you compare me to de l'Espinois? Wait, you're explaining to me that I'm not far from being a prisoner when no charges are held against me. I don't have a lawyer, I'm treated like a dangerous lunatic, and at the same time you're telling me that in the eyes of many people I'm a true hero. Calm down. In this kind of case, everything is complicated. I sincerely regret it, but we have no choice, and you even less. And what had to happen happened. Now I more easily embraced my new reactions. I had spent my whole life avoiding outbursts. Conflicts made me uncomfortable, and violence had always horrified me. But for some obscure but necessary reason, in the span of a few days, my mindset, or probably just my mind, had changed. All of this had a meaning, but I was still far from understanding it. Once Asvut finished his sentence, that voice that had repeatedly grated on my ears and that we hadn't heard for a while reappeared. Hesse, sit down and shut up now! Agent Trill shouted. My gaze slowly turned towards the creature. My finger had not stopped pointing at him. I had him in my sights. In a short time, I saw the same fear on his face again. I was powerful, and he was nothing. I took a step to stand in front of him, grabbed him by the collar, and despite his size and imposing build, I lifted him from his seat and off the ground. The scene must have been impressive, David asserting a strength greater than Goliath's. I looked him straight in the eyes. It was exhilarating. I reveled in his fear. I reveled in his helplessness. The scene, which for me had lasted long enough for me to savor it, must have been short. After knocking Trill out by throwing him against a wall about two meters away, 
I was quickly immobilized by several guards and lost consciousness due to an injection administered to me. Reflecting on this scene, I realized that facing that damn trill, my physical strength had been multiplied, but facing these men, it had returned to normal. Perhaps I didn't hate them enough.